percent of the total uh, were candidates for surgery, uh, but for whatever reason refused treatment. And so there are 455 patients. We can understand what happens if you could treat a lung cancer of stage one, but elect not to. Uh, and, and the results weren't good. So if our patients had treated stage one disease, median survival was 69 months. But if you had untreated stage one disease, survival was only nine months. Uh, even on those patients who could have had treatment but refused, um, survival was 14 months. So it's not simply a matter of someone's overall health and inability to go on to surgery. Uh, if they have you know, untreated stage one cancer, even the earliest stage of uh, the disease, uh, survival is poor. So this is in contrast to some other conditions such as you know early uh, low risk uh, prostate cancer where patients can live for many years with the diagnosis and could very reasonably choose observation as a standard of care uh, in lung cancer, even with stage one, if it's untreated, most patients who have the disease will die of the disease uh, if, if it is not managed. And so radiation therapy. Uh, before we had SBRT, uh, what we had was uh, old-fashioned conventional radiation therapy. Our patients would be treated uh, with doses around two to two and a half grade per day over a period of six to seven weeks. And historically, uh, this has led to suboptimal uh, or poor outcomes. Uh, as techniques have advanced, we've seen the safety of giving higher doses per in excess of three grade per fraction. Uh, and with this, we've seen intermediate outcomes. Uh, but this then um, really culminated in useful treatment once we could deliver this as SBRT. Uh, and really what SBRT entails here would be very high doses of radiation, uh, even tenfold higher than what we historically gave the fraction, giving this to a single target in the body, and with this in higher local control and overall survival. So going back to what conventional radiation therapy entailed, you know, th this um, back in the days before the 90s uh, was based on uh, 2D radiographs, on the right, one would see the tumor as best they could on pain domes, um, draw a margin around that, and basically treat what we call this postage stack field. These targets could be defined by CT, um, that technology became available, but nevertheless, this was uh, um, the type of treatment given uh, when you were giving, say, because you can't be quite sure where the tumor is, uh, the tumor field often had to larger than what we might give now. Uh, we're not sure whether we're covering microscopic disease. Um, overall, these treatments were, you know, convenient to patients having to come in for 30 plus visits over six to eight weeks. Um, and there were other technical limitations as well. And so for these sort of outcomes um, that we've seen with this technique, uh, local control was uh, maybe at best like 30 to 50% for five years and overall survival tend to So this overall survival is quite a low figure, uh, but keep in mind this is a combination of to what's related to tumor control, but also that these are thicker patients who had radiation alone back when it was treatment because surgery was the preferred uh, modality. Probability of local control was associated as one with the tumor size of the radiation dose, so people tried to maximize this could achieve uh, at the time uh, without SBRT. And it came down to being in, unable to deliver a sufficient dose to achieve tumor control without causing injury to the surrounding lung tissue. And the target localization generally was poor. Uh, they, they did not have the availability that we do nowadays to guide treatments using daily imaging. And uh, it wasn't good, really, to be giving these courses of treatment that could last to two months for patients who are quite ill, uh, even at least. Going up in dose, but using non-SBR techniques has helped. If you take a look at the effects of using dose perfection, which was enabled in the 3D conformal era, this led to higher biologically effective dose given to the tumors. And with this, um, say giving four gray a day to doses of six gray, um, local control at uh, three years, for example, here, uh, was quite a bit better going up into the 70 to 80 percent range, but certainly considerably better than the 30 to 50 percent range that one saw 
uh, with the conventional radiation. Uh, but uh, what really changed our ability to treat these patients was SDRT. Again, the idea is to give very high dose uh, to a very carefully shaped area, highly conformal. This was developed over the last 10 to 15 years. It was an offshoot of craniostereotactic radiosurgery. Uh, for decades, we were able to treat uh, rather accurately tumors within the skull because uh, sites within the brain don't move with respect to the skull, so target localization there was um, oddly much more straightforward than uh, in the lung where to respiratory motion, for example, uh, and difficulty of seeing these uh, targets. Um, we had less precision until we had image guided modern technique. Now that we have these, we feel comfortable giving as much as five to 10 times the dose per fraction, which leads to a two-fold higher total effective dose against the tumor. And with this, we can expect that the tumors are actually being ablated or destroyed as opposed to just being controlled for a while. And in the United States, it's SDRT provided this delivered within one to five treatments. These treatments are typically given over a period of one to five. So in general, the principles, again, uh, are that with radiation therapy, your targeting is only as good as how well you uh, localize uh, the tumor. And so you want to have rigid immobilization of the patient. Uh, here on the right, you see um, on the treatment table, the patient is placed on essentially a full-length backlog bed um, or, you know, alpha cradle, but anyhow, something that conforms to the shape of the patient and allows the entire uh, patient to be immobilized uh, so that each can be reproducible and the patient will not be moving to a fraction. Real-time imaging uh, is used these days to align the patient and the tumor into the correct position in what they call stereotactic space. It's just a way of localizing the tumors in 3D. It's not so much that that's the key, it's just uh, as long as the tumor is well visualized and localized to the technique. And these days, we seek to account for tumor motion throughout the respiratory cycle. You know, these tumors um, as people breathe, and so one would either try to limit the motion uh, by doing techniques such as breath holds or active breathing uh, controls, uh, or uh, aiding to limit the treatment to when only the tumor is in a position, such as an expiration, um, or actually tracking the tumor as you treat. Um, but again, uh, you can do this in a number of ways, but the key is to give uh, dose uh, from multiple uh, angles. You can do that with multiple fixity, like you see on the left here, or uh, you can do it with uh, uh, something like uh, arc therapy, rapid arc from very end, for example. Uh, but you could use uh, these uh, fields that would deliver dose um, that all converges upon the target, as you can see on the uh, right here, uh, the target itself is getting the uh, high dose needed to ablate the tumor reflected in this red colored dose color wash, whereas the contributing beams from other angles are, are all tolerable to the normal tissues and it's that conversion at the target which allows the uh, tumor ablation. And often with the way we center these beams, the center of the tumor uh, can actually be treated to a really quite high dose, although we have a prescription dose here say something like 54 gray as an example, the center of tumor could get as high as 130% of that, uh, for example. So that, even maybe more resistant cancer that could find the center of a tumor uh, might be well controlled. So how well does this all work? So we have some uh, prospective data. Uh, this RTOG0236 uh, trial uh, was the key, but even before that was this Indiana Phase Two trial that um, was published by uh, Bob Timmerman's colleagues, where they did this Phase Two study in 70 patients um, with medically inoperable disease stage one between 2002 and 2005, gave 60 gray in just three fractions of 20 gray at treatment, um, used the uh, same kind of eligibility I mentioned for RTOG basically poor pulmonary function no better than 40% of what someone should have, um, or the uh, presence of comorbidity that included surgery. Here, tumors were limited to be seven centimeters uh, at in diameter. 
And in this series, uh, you know, there was a mix of patients who had stage one and stage, uh, sorry, E1, stage two disease. Um, patients were fairly average, age of 70, and majority had COPD, and there was a mix of squamous and adenocarcinoma histology. Outcomes uh, for this um, were quite promising. So at a median follow-up of 15 months, um, the local control was 88%. So this was higher than we've ever really seen with other techniques of radiation, and getting close to what you would see with surgery. Uh, overall survival was 42.7%. And keeping in mind this is still a sick population. Toxicities uh, were fairly reasonable. Uh, grade three or four more serious toxicities were found in only 11% of patients who experienced decreased pulmonary function, pneumonia, neural effusions, largely pulmonary effects, although there could be also skin irritation from the entrance um, There was um, grade five toxicity. This early series, six patients died, or 8.6% largely from pulmonary uh, toxicities, including pneumonia, hemoptysis, and And what they learned in going back to seeing why some patients experienced severe toxicity or died, uh, they found that it was the tumors that were close to the bronchial tree, um, this area that you see on the right uh, within the now called danger zone, where if tumors were located within two centimeters, uh, the trachea, uh, the distal trachea, the uh, bronchi, uh, as they um, up to the point of the uh, lobar bronchi, uh, if the tumors were located in this zone, uh, then the rate of grade three to five toxicities is higher than if they were outside of this zone. Uh, with the central tumors, as they're called, the toxicity rates were 27% for grade three to five, 18% death. This is in contrast to the much more favorable figures. First of all, area where grade three to five was 10% and grade five, 4%. So here uh, they, they saw that there was very promising local control and overall survival, that's the RT, although a note of caution, there's higher toxicity rates when treating central tumors, at least with the dose and fractionation they used here. So three fraction SBRT anyhow, remains something that is not recommended or tumors that are in this central area. Uh, and it was felt that at this point, further study was required in a multi-institutional setting. So what really led to the adoption of SBRT was this trial, RTO-0236, run by the uh, radiation group. Um, this um, study only had 55 patients in it and was quite similar to the Indiana protocol. Uh, really just tumors were limited to under five centimeters here. It was quite a similar study excluding patients with central tumors based on the Indiana experience. So, uh, you know, here, because of the smaller tumor restriction, most were P1, again, oncology, and the results here were, again, quite favorable. Even at um, the five-year up primary tumor control, uh, this really showed great figures. Five years, uh, the tumor control was 93%, which is about what you would expect to see with uh, uh, any anything less uh, than a, a full lobectomy for surgical resection. Toxicities here, because they only had the uh, peripheral tumors, was quite reasonable. Uh, moderate toxicity, 24%, and severe grade 4 toxicity, 4%. And the most common toxicities were either pulmonary or musculoskeletal. So uh, with this, it looked like SBRT could be delivered safely in a, in a multi-institutional way. Um, and uh, you know, the longer term the local control rates were high. The treatments were well tolerated, outcomes certainly uh, side by side, superior to historical outcomes of uh, conventional radiation therapy. And so, this trial, uh, more than anything, established SBRT as a new standard of care, medically inoperable non fossil lung cancer in the uh, there have been a number of series uh, that have uh, show, recapitulated these data. Um, these, in general, uh, you can see, uh, show all local controls in the two to three year range in excess of 90%. Uh, limited, more limited data, but uh, closer to five years, it still maintains a tumor control rate of about 90%, quite favorable. 
And, and you know, even in a, again, going back to how aggressive even stage one lung cancer can be, uh, even in the elderly population, uh, if, if you take a look at outcomes with population compared to SBRP, um, median survival difference uh, was quite profound, where it was only 10 months uh, with observation and keeping on the California registry study, but increased up to 29 months uh, with SBRP. And then, you know, people look to see, you know, what dose uh, should be used for this treatment. Uh, we've been using uh, from this point times three um, uh, for technical reasons with modern heterogeneity correction and other um, newer ways of calculating the radiation. This 18 grade times three is the same as the original Indiana 20 grade times three. It really became a widely adopted dose. Although people started exploring other dose combinations uh, ranging from anywhere between one to 10 fractions, uh, giving uh, fraction size to one fraction is 30 some gray. And so, you know, we had to think about, you know, how to evaluate these regimens. Is there one size fit all approach? Uh, different doses would be appropriate for different tumors. Uh, what kind of comparative data do we have uh, comparing these different uh, ways of giving SBRT? I think a highlight of a smart approach for this was seen from uh, a group. Uh, at BUMC, which treated patients in 2011. And what they did was they treated, um, you know, the peripheral uh, tumors to the same kind of 18 to 20 grade time three approach that we've been talking about. But then they saw that if tumors were brought to contact the chest wall, because the chest wall was one of the um, structures where we saw toxicity, musculoskeletal toxicity, here they lowered the dose they gave per to 7 or 12 gray and gave it over five treatments instead of three. Uh, and then, uh, of note, uh, the, the, the explorer treating tumors that were um, more adjacent to the central structure are hyla marmigiastinum, but back down to just 7 by gray uh, times 8. Again, this, of note, it would have been considered SDRT in the United States, um, but nevertheless, still pretty high dose perfection. Um, and so, in these patients, uh, of note, 31% who were operable uh, show results like these, uh, where uh, the uh, local control rates, even at five years, um, again, are about the 90% range. Um, and 51% of these patients reported no toxicity. When there were toxicities, there was largely uh, fatigue, uh, some chest wall pain, a nausea, dyspnea, cough, and grade three pneumonitis. Even here, you can see that the rate of grade three pneumonitis was quite low, at three percent in their series, um, showing that if uh, one selects the appropriate location, one could still maintain very favorable outcomes in terms of tumor control but without the excess of toxicity. Although longer-term follow-up is needed here, one caveat with this series and how the results could be very good. The patients in this series were treated without a biopsy. There is a possibility that some number of the patients treated had what looked radiographically like the tumor, but wasn't. If you look at more modern series uh, um, that examine you know, the percent of patients who undergo surgery turn out not to have uh, non spousal lung cancer, it's something like 15% of patients have uh, cancer at all. Uh, at the time, uh, something sticks it out. It could have been a granuloma or some other benign thing. So, so that may help, uh, affect the results somewhat. And if you go through all the different studies where people explored all these different doses, what it is, uh, is that it's not necessarily uh, exactly the dose and fraction that matters, but kind of what the net, bi net biological effect would be uh, combining you know, all these factors to see what the tumor biologically effective dose would be, the CED10 here, as long as it's high enough, the local recurrence rate is low, what you see in this green line. If it was lower than a certain threshold, here they set it at a CED uh, of 105 grams, uh, which reflects um, the most modern uh, uh, um, you know, radiation schemes. Uh, a dose uh, under that would be a little less than what's given typically now, but you can see higher rates of local recurrence. It does take a certain amount of dose 
to expect control. Um, how do you, how can you, you know, compare some of these things? Just to give a quick example of this, there was an RTOG study, 0915, that took a look at uh, 34 gray in a single fraction, 12 gray times 4, 8 gray. And, and um, even though the BEDs were all, um, you know, all over the place, you know, 105 uh, for the um, 12 gray times 4 uh, scheme and 50 for the 34 gray times 1, seems like as long as you give enough, it's good enough. Uh, the tumor control rates here at five years are both about the same at 93 percent. And with that, what we've seen interestingly in the United States over the trend uh, is that there's been an use of four to five percent uh, uh, types of regimens rather than the fewer treatments. Uh, the total biologically effective dose may therefore be in the lower range of 100 to 130, uh, but maybe that's good enough. And maybe if the uh, toxicity risk, depending on where you treat, uh, is higher if you try to give it in fewer fractions, especially in more cellular disease, um, then th this may be in fact uh, warranted. But going back to these central tumors, because it, you know the, the tumors they show up in this. Um, you know, dotted danger zone pretty common. Uh, one wanted to explore could with one of these uh, lower schemes, say like by fraction, still treat tumors in this area safely because we know we can't in three fractions. Um, and so this gave some data here uh, where with the systematic review of 20 studies for which were prospective, we have 563 central tumors treated with SBRT. Um, the toxicity rates uh, when people use these more gentle vaccination schemes, still SBRT, uh, the rate was only 16 out of 563, or 2.8 percent treatment-related death, but much better than what we saw back in Indiana. And the median time to death when they did occur was still relatively narrow, at 1.5 months. Uh, but overall, the rate of grade three or four toxicity was uh, at 8.6 percent. The RTOG then did a a study uh, taking a look at uh, uh, central events, um, and here was trying to uh, determine the optimal for this. Uh, 120 patients were ultimately approved to the study that was published this May, um, and uh, they had as an endpoint the maximum tolerated dose uh, on the grade of 20% or higher grade three toxicities. Uh, they used a Bayesian design uh, to inform what dose level should be tested. Assuming that these uh, toxicities, when they occur, mostly treatment. And, on, and they, what they did was they started at a dose escalation uh, plan, like so, where they started in the middle with 50 gray and te uh, 10 gray fractions. They to go up if it was tolerable or down. Uh, and ultimately, they went all the way up to their highest uh, level nine dose up from 12 gray fractions to 60 gray. And what they saw with this. Um, Design here uh, is that there were, you know, a scattered number of toxicities. Um, if you look at, say, um, the highest dose level, 12 gray, uh, which was tested in 30 uh, patients who were evaluable for toxicity. Um, one patient had pneumonitis. One, one patient uh, had a grade five toxicity, uh, but for the most part, uh, patients um, uh, had the overall. And the results were, you know, pretty good. Uh, if you look at the curves down below, uh, one can see that the low control rates uh, depicts the highest two dose levels here, probably 0.5 at 12 gray, where they had the most tested. Uh, you can see the local control rates at three years uh, remained around 85 uh, percent, which is uh, pretty favorable considering these are all local uh, central tumors uh, that were treated. So overall, this uh, dose uh, limiting toxicity rate is low, 7.2% uh, at this uh, high dose. But we have to recognize that these treatments are completely benign uh, with treatment of central tumors maybe accepting a 4% treatment-related mortality rate. Of course, keep in mind that these cancers left untreated are extremely serious. Um, and, and for you know reasons of the Bayesian design, we don't really know 50 gray really that much worse than 60 gray. Uh, there aren't enough patients in the series to answer a question like that, nor can we really answer how safe is it to give these different structures in the lung, different organs that uh, 
because um, there's just not enough patients. Some people really then wanted to see just really how central you could go. So Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, did this series where they, they had patients who had tumors that got closer and closer to the bronchial tree. In fact, even some that were right on it. Uh, but uh, the takeaway from this is that although you could uh, quite safely treat tumors that are outside the danger zone, maybe you could step in it a little bit, even within one centimeter of the uh, danger zone, which you see here in yellow. Uh, there were still no deaths here, although you see the grade three talk rate went up from 7% outside of this down to 30% uh, inside of this. So it's a serious thing to get into danger zone. But if you're right on the bronchial tree, it still is off limits. Although there were no deaths when, when you're far enough away from the tree, even if that meant you were within one centimeter, but not right on the tree. When you were right on the tree, 20% of patients died. And so at present, we do not think uh, that treatment of tumors that are really not just nearby but on the bronchial tree uh, can be treated uh, with our current techniques of SPR. Um, uh, and but of course there are caveats. You know we we have these arbitrary sizes that were uh, designated They're not anatomical constructs, so they they do reflect uh, how those end up going to these structures. There is a continuum of risk. So um, the closer you get to the tree higher the risk, and then one has to make a judgment call if each patient was reasonable. One can, with fractionation and dose reduction, mitigate, you know, reduce the risk, um, but this could be at the expense of tumor control. We saw that as you drop the biologically equivalent dose uh, below uh, that 100, 105, the local control rate suffered. The hope is that with improvements in technology, this could improve safety and efficacy of the treatment. And so, Something that we are just about to start here uh, in Brigham and, uh, and Dana Farber is actually um, what was termed stereotactic MR guided adaptive radiation therapy, uh, or has SMART as an acronym. Um, this is based off of experience at Washington University, where they had this very small phase one trial of five patients um, with ultra central tumor that are abutting the uh, structure. And the goal here is to safely treat uh, tumors. The, the minimum dose you need for optimal tumor control in five fractions. Um, and why this could work is you can see from these MR images, which are taken to guide each daily Dyna plan that doesn't give high dose to the or esophagus, as you can see here in the midline structures. But each day, even though you plan them that way, they might set up slightly differently enough so that those structures can go right into uh, the high dose volumes can go right into these structures, and then this would be leading to the toxicity despite what we are trying to plan to do. Uh, but if you could adapt the treatment that moment to uh, ensure that the high dose stays off of these treatments, and uh, maybe the treatments can be safe, you're really being able to uh, give protection within that millimeter or uh, that you need to be off the structure right against the tumor. And so far, this is very early data. But they've been seen in these five patients, uh, perfect local control and no grade three toxicities, at least at six months. Although, of course, a lot more time to see what the local control remains. So, take home points for stereotactic radiation for tumors. Uh, there's that continuum of risk uh, treating these um, tumors. You could mitigate the risk with uh, how you choose the dose of vaccination. And it is possible to give SBRT within. The bronchial tree um, this way, although if you're really with tumors adjacent to the airways, uh, maybe SBRT might not be the safest until so you have more advanced options. Uh, but one could also try altered hyperfractionation schemes, for example, to deliver kind of a more moderate dose. Might lose some local control, uh, but at least uh, offer some treatment that So just a few comparisons uh, going back between comparing SRT, uh, which had really, really good results, the tumor controls in the 90% range, uh, survivals uh, limited due to the patient population. And so with conventional radiation, these poor figures, but it's not really a fair comparison when you think about it. We're taking very modern radiation uh, given with all the technology we currently have. Comparing it to the kind of radiation people gave in 
in 80s. So maybe if you actually compare uh, the, uh, the treatments with the same technology, just the different doses, such as this base trial uh, in, done in Scandinavia, where they randomized people to either SBRT or conventional radiation. Uh, interestingly, what they saw here was with local control, uh, even if you give it without SBRT, but you give it with the same level of precision, with modern image guidance, um, the local control, at least in this series, looks exactly the same what you got with SBRT, 86% and ICR. So is it possible it's not just it's the SBRT that matters, but just knowing that you are actually treating the are very accurately? Here are the curves that you see for progression-free and overall survival, showing that the curves basically post. Um, and then uh, you know, they did some surveys to look at toxicities from these. Now the toxicities were better, you know, uh, lower well, for say off or short conventional radiation. So there's still some rationale for giving SBRT compared to conventional. Uh, but nevertheless, maybe a reasonable option. RT. You just want to do it using modern uh, targeted guidance. Um, and so, you know, some issues with this particular trial, uh, the local control wasn't necessarily clearly defined, uh, and um, there, there could have been a little bit of imbalance in the arms, but nevertheless, it was um, about, um, you know, comparing technologies uh, in the same era and, and given in the same way, except just with Here's a contrasting study, though, the, uh, the CHISEL trial that was published this April um, that showed that if you compare SBRT randomized trial uh, uh, in a randomized way to uh, conformal old-fashioned, um, you, you saw in this study uh, actually different results where the local control uh, rate was the, the expected 89% of SBRT, uh, but in this series, the conventional rates at two years wasn't as good at 65 percent. So why there was a difference here um, compared to the other trial uh, we speculate on, uh, here were the results where SDRT being very good for local control, uh, conventional radiation uh, fairly uh, worse than this, uh, and overall survival correspondingly poorer with conventional treatment. Uh, perhaps this uh, related to, you know, some technical things with regard to um, how the uh, credentialing of all of these technologies was done. Uh, one can only really speculate. Uh, but nevertheless, taking these two together, at, at least the one trial showed lower toxicity uh, with SBRT compared to conventional radiation. This one maintains that SBRT is superior in terms of tumor outcomes. Then one may want to uh, still do SBRT that is available. You know, comparing to hypofractionated rate and a more moderate doses, it does look like the uh, local control uh, is poor with hypofractionated radiation. On the top here, uh, we see the BEDs in the 100 to 150 range with local control of uh, the tumor in the 97 percent range. Um, these hypofractionated radiation schemes may be giving the same total dose, say 60 gray, but by giving it in 15 fractions as opposed to five fractions, that has an effect of lowering the biological effect of dose below 100. And as you drop it below 100, you see here that the figure uh, dropped to the 70 to 80 percent range, to the 90 percent range. Here is a, a, a comparison um, in, by Sunny Brook looking at you know these two kinds of approaches, and what you see overall survival again is worse, uh, as is uh, local control. These four gray uh, treatments that are the more SBRT level dose. So an option, if there is no, no SBRT available at some price. Um, keep in mind that uh, this comparison I just gave does suffer somewhat from comparison, um, you know, different files and not in a randomized way. Uh, and so, to that end, there is a, a trial underway trying to look at this in a randomized way uh, to and see whether with this trial comparing uh, four gray a treatment versus four gray a treatment, um, again,
again, different biologically effective doses. Um, but we'll have an answer once it uh, reads out. Um, but I would, again, stress that if you had to treat someone without SDRT, I would still recommend you do it with something like this four gray uh, type 15 treatment, truly conventional radiation. There was that phase trial, uh, but uh, it's really a standout compared to other data suggesting that uh, higher doses per fraction lead to better tumor control. Now, what about comparing SBRT to surgery? Uh, so, you know, always remain the standard that if a person can have their tumor taken out, uh, one would do so with surgery. But here was a phase two trial where they gave SBRT to patients who actually could have gone to surgery, but didn't want to, and explore SBRT as an option on the trial. And, and it led to this question, could SBRT replace surgery? So there were multiple randomized trials that have been attempted, but in general, everything failed to accrue well because of you know, patients and providers not really wanting to randomize between uh, these two very different kinds of treatments. But at least if you look at this um, you know, series of 33 patients uh, who were operable uh, but went to get SRT uh, anyway, you know, the local control rates were good. Um, there's no reason to think they'd be worse than healthier patients. The four year local control was 96% in this series. But look here, but the overall survival figure at four years was 56%. Way better than what we saw with the other SBRT data. But keep in mind, these are operable patients. So in general, they're healthier. So it wouldn't be fair to compare their overall survival of surgery versus radiation if you're comparing healthy patients to sick patients with comorbidities. But here, with the operable uh, patient population, Survival figures look good. The toxicity rates were actually quite low. Um, only uh, two to three toxicities. And nobody had grade four or higher toxicity, reflecting that these treatments are even safer when you're giving them to healthy patients. Um, and then, you know, here are just some figures uh, comparing um, different trial data together. But I think what might be a bit, bit important to point out as you make these comparisons. Um, that how you define local therapy matters. In RTOG 0236, they really only defined it based on failure around where you treated the tumor, which would not be a fair comparison against like a full lobectomy where you're moving a low but dissecting off the hilum. That said, if you were to try to use a similar definition uh, and actually do it in a randomized way, there were two trials that did very poorly in terms of accrual, but we made at least some attempt uh, to pull the data together trials, which were attempting to look at overall survival differences uh, versus surgery. Uh, and what we saw here was that the results were actually, by you know, the mix of factors in these uh, two trials, uh, compelling, uh, where one trial only had many valuable patients and 120, and there were a bunch of different uh, subtle differences between the trials. But when you pull it together and look at the 27 patients that had surgery versus the 31 patients at DRT, uh, the overall survival figure, well, well, oddly enough, for this actually looked superior for the SBRT lobectomy. And the tumor control, um, the lobar control, was at 96 percent um, with SBRT, uh, although 100 percent with surgery. None of these figures were going to be significant. Numbers again were quite small, but at least a hint uh, that uh, surgery and radiation may lead to equivalent outcomes. And so maybe surgical resection isn't actually needed. More data will be needed to support or the Bible curves uh, showing, again, interestingly better results with uh, SBRT. Certainly less toxicity compared to surgery. Uh, where here, the greater grade three or for toxicity with surgery, 44% compared to only 10% with SBR. Uh, and, and this may, in part, uh, explain why the survival is better with the less invasive technique. Um, although, again, like I said, everything has to be read with a bit of caveat. These were, uh, this was a poll analysis of two under studies. The provocative, controversial follow-up was still too short, sample size too small, make any definitive conclusions, but I think really does do highlight that we would want data from 
larger trial. See, maybe that uh, SBRT could be a worthy alternative standard of care uh, for patients, even if they're operating. So we did try to do a trial in the RTOG uh, to do this in a randomized way, uh, looking at subflow bar resections, maybe um, as opposed to doing lobectomies, to see if the resections that people tend to give um, in higher risk surgical candidates um, and compare that to SBRT. Maybe that's a fair comparison. Uh, but that couldn't accrue either. So uh, it's, there is now an attempt to do this with a privately funded trial of stable mate. Uh, and then there's an um, ongoing trial I mentioned during accelerated hypofractionated radiation, SBRT. Uh, I, I'm not really touching on this too much, but I did want to mention uh, that we are looking at other things other than just how we give the radiation. Uh, there is a phase three study that's underway right now uh, looking at SBRT and, and then seeing whether adding immunotherapy to this uh, could be helpful. Um, it's called the Pacific 4 or RTG3515 study for those with biopsy proven lung cancer who've got their SBRT. And it's asking the question of whether um, adding their value map um, may be helpful. Um, rule goal is uh, 630. It started this year, so we're not going to get an answer to this trial until 2025. Um, so we'll have to stay tuned to see whether it makes sense to add any kind of systemic therapy, such as immunotherapy to SBRT, uh, but hopefully we'll, we will one day have that act. And then finally, about the toxicity of these treatments, uh, for the most part, the toxicity is reasonable, uh, great toxicity to 20% of patients. The profile is different compared to conventional radiation with chest pain seen in maybe 10 or 20% of patients due to uh, musculoskeletal toxicity get these rib fractures, although most often they're asymptomatic. Um, and we do see some effect on pulmonary function, although not dramatic, maybe a, the FP1 and DLCO of about 5% at one year. Uh, pulmonary toxicity here, uh, you can see, um, is a concern given how patients often have poor baseline lung function. Uh, but here we see all the beams converging on this nodule that you see on the left. What you see on the right is fibrosis around the treated area. And in fact, the fibrosis is in an area that's bigger than the original tumor was because even the lower dose surrounding the tumor was enough to cause some lung scar. Something to keep in mind if you're looking at CT scans after SBRT, you may see all of this sort of fibrosis. You have to recognize that it could be fibrosis as opposed to something like tumor spread. Um, Knowing that some patient had a history of SBRT uh, and looking for changes to the treatment would be important. So, pulmonary toxicity, as a reminder, was observed in 16% of patients in that uh, landmark RTOGO2 study. Uh, but in general, um, the decrease in function may be uh, around 5%. Um, longer term effects will require uh, further study to really understand chest wall toxicity here. Um, what they saw in one series was uh, based on the 0236 data, that if you uh, give higher and higher doses of uh, or amounts of radiation to the chest wall, uh, you'll see more toxicity. And maybe the amount that crosses over a threshold dose 30 A of, of uh, radiation to the chest wall, the higher volume of uh, the chest wall that gets that dose, higher the risk of toxicity. So, uh, if you limit how much of the chest pump gets 30 gray or higher to 30 uh, CC or less, the risk of toxicity was lower. At least. And, you know, we're still learning about what the late effects of this radiation to the lung could be. Uh, here was an example of a patient uh, we had that developed necrosis uh, abscess in the treated area, and although the tumor itself all surrounding not a profound radiation change, wasn't tumor, but was uh, due again to um, uh, late effects on lung tissue. Uh, how we uh, follow up patients after SBRT has been variable, but for the most part, people look with a repeat chest scan every three to six months or so uh, in the first three and then space it out to maybe one year after that. Uh, looking for local recurrence, and although those are rare, and more importantly, looking for regional recurrences like. Not being 
treated this, uh, with this technique, but also very importantly, looking outside, outside the box. When you treat a stage one lung cancer, even though you may have a very high chance of destroying the lung cancer itself, because these tumors do spread uh, pretty readily to the lymph nodes uh, and to the rest of the body, one must keep a close eye on this uh, in case additional treatments may be needed, or so then uh, worry about the tumor itself coming back. There are some patients who do look at a PET CT. Um, Know, some months after treatment to show that the tumor treated went cold and other things didn't pop up along the way. Recurrence patterns after SBRT, you can see here um, that uh, the recurrences where they do occur in the first couple of years, in the first four bar, like the first months after radiation treatment, although later recurrences can occur. And so that we still uh, advise that patient followed for a total of five years. So to summarize about SBRT, it's a safe and effective technique, non-invasive. It's an option for patients with medically inoperable stage one disease. So figuring out the optimal treatment regimen located tumors. That surgical resection remains the standard of care, although and comparative trials comparing surgery and SBRT have failed properly. However, it is uh, something that is worthy of your study. And at least in those patients who have borderline health, uh, one should really try to make a choice between sub low bar resections and SBRT, which you can on a case to case level, looking at the toxicity, the patient's comorbidities, where the tumor is, and, and really have a discussion between the patient and the surgeon uh, to determine all of this. And so at uh, our institute, uh, patients are given SBRT if they're medically inoperable or if they're if you have tumors that are no more than five centimeters, preferably located are the best, although the uh, central tumors, as long as they're not too central, can also be treated. Uh, and we've adopted a, a technique much like what we do at BUMC for patients. Three fraction approach if they're away from the central tree, uh, five fractions if they are uh, near the chest wall or near the danger zone, uh, more, more protracted hypofractionated radiation. The tumor is right on top of the bronchial tree because we saw that was possible. And use modern techniques such as tumor motion incorporation uh, and real time verification with interaction images. Of the tree. So, I wanted to close with uh, showing one example um, of a case uh, which I treated a patient who had stage one disease, he's six years old, small T1B and zero left upper nodule, he's taking three fractions, and just to get Quickly through the scan, you see here uh, a, a small tumor in the left upper lobe, which I outlined here. You have the PTV, a five millimeter expansion around that for setup. It's this uh, red color, so it's a small target. We had the radiation uh, extend a run mark around this tumor. We have a very nice high dose here in red uh, around the tumor with lower doses surrounding that. Um, and then uh, you can uh, see here. Uh, you know, we keep track of the doses to the lung, the chest wall, the, the vessel, the trachea, the esophagus, the core, all that. It's really only the tumor itself, which is getting very high doses here. And one could take a look at the metric established a series of what we consider to be safe doses for each of the structures. Uh, and with this treatment, the patient very well had not had tumor recovery. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's my presentation on stage one lung cancer. I'm and I'd be happy to take any questions. Yes, thank you so much, David. It was an excellent presentation. Uh, I have a few questions, and then we will ask others to ask you questions if they want to. Um, you you have shown us a lot of data about um, medically inoperable. Uh, non-small cell lung cancer or lung cancers, but what is your uh, opinion about uh, metas metastasis, uh, oligometastatic disease to the lungs? Have you been doing um, SPRT for lung metastasis? Would you recommend it? And what doses have you been uh, giving so far for these lesions? Right. So uh, yeah, I, I figure the focus was stage one today, but um, the technique can be exactly uh, applied the same way to lung metastases. You know, certain types of tumors like sarcomas and colorectal malignancies 
have a propensity to form lung metastases. And we found, um, uh, you know, the same sort of efficacy if you treat these when they're oligometastatic disease. The, the metastasis itself that you treat can have local control rates also in the, you know, the 80 to 90 percent range uh, long term, just the same as if it were a primary lung tumor. I mean, because it is metastatic disease, um, where we would see um, outcomes be less favorable is simply, um, you know, out of field uh, further recurrence where we didn't treat. Although that's sometimes something that can be managed. I've had patients who've had, for example, um, what we thought was oligometastatic colorectal cancer, who would develop a, a lung metastasis. We treat um, that first with surgery, take it out, develops another one that gets resected, develops two more. We treat those with stereotactic radiation, develops a couple more. We take those out with surgery, and then a couple more show up, and we treat those with SDRT. Um, and then we kind of find between uh, the surgeon and us um, who's the best person to take out each individual lesion. And I've had patients live for five, six, seven years uh, with, with what would over time have been widespread um, lung metastases, but because they all came out metachronously one by one or two, two at a time, we, met, we can extend life, you know, like I said, for years this way. Um, so I think, you know, a balanced approach looking at whatever is the uh, less toxic um, method, if it's a peripheral lesion right up against the chest wall that could be wedged out easily and the patient's operable, maybe that's still better because we can cause some chest wall toxicity if we treat right against the rib. But if it's a little bit deeper inside but not against the bronchus, um, SBRT is really quite good there. Uh, we might opt for that as opposed to surgery, even if surgery is an option. I think with wise use of SBRT um, and uh, let's say a lack of um, you know more efficacious systemic therapies, I should have mentioned that this is after the patient had tried and failed systemic therapy, uh, and so only really investigational approaches were left. Um, th this kept this example patient alive probably for another five or so years beyond what we would otherwise have expected. Okay, thank you. And just another question. Do you have any experience uh, of chemotherapy combination with SPRT in medically inoperable lung cancer? Right. So in general, we do not favor concurrent chemotherapy and radiation. I, I mean, it's probably not always going to be unsafe to do if it's a, a you know a tumor that's not abutting any critical structures. I imagine it would probably be safe, but but the reason we won't favor it is that first, it's not necessary to achieve tumor control. The tumors um, are being ablated generally with these 90% local control figures, so adding chemo won't be expected to help it during treatment. But what I would recommend is, if, if for example, especially with somebody who has um, you know oligometastatic cancer, just hold the systemic therapy if they can. Uh, during the SBRT, treat the lesions, and then resume therapy after. And then there's a the question, because these patients do occasionally fail outside of the treated area, you know, in the nodes or at distant metastases, even if they have stage, stage one lung cancer, people have explored that. And I think there it'll come down to the same kind of data you've seen in surgical theories. If you have a small two-centimeter tumor and you resect that with surgery, there's no evidence that um, chemotherapy is needed in an adjuvant setting there. Um, likewise, after SBRT, probably not. But what people are currently exploring are, um, you know, is chemotherapy helpful for if you had like a four centimeter or a bigger tumor treated? Uh, is it helpful to give immunotherapy, as I mentioned in our ongoing trial? Um, I think time will tell whether these turn out to be helpful. Okay. Any questions? No questions. Thank you. I think we are done. Uh, right. We don't have questions. Thank you so much for a nice presentation, David. It was very nice. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak. And if uh, there are questions that come up after uh, afterward, I'd be happy to take them. Yes. Thank you. We can email you the questions if we uh, if you have any. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. Will are you? Okay. Bye. Hi. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Thanks so much for David. Thanks. Uh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, 
I will I will send you an email. I'll I'll send you an email after some time. So okay. we had some questions about the presentation, but we will discuss it later. But thank you so much for the presentation. You're welcome. Sure. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you so much, okay. Dr. Mera. Thank you. I will switch off from the outside. Thank you.